Muy buenos días, mi nombre es Aler Brown Gord, soy el director ejecutivo de la Casa de California en México, la Casa de la Universidad de California en México, y es un placer para mí tenerlos a todos ustedes aquí, es un placer para mí que nosotros seamos la sede para eh, el reporte que se está presentando el día de hoy de la aceleración de plataformas de materiales. Esto es parte de Mission Innovation, de la revolución de energía limpia y tenemos el placer de tener con nosotros el día de hoy el subsecretario Rodolfo Lacey de SNR, tenemos también al Associate Deputy Minister for Natural Resources Canada, el señor Frank de Rossier, este, la doctora Rebecca Findlay, también de Canadá, de este, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Tenemos a Alan Aspuri, que, quien es el eh, <coughs> autor principal del reporte y que nos va a dar una presentación acerca de esto. Y también a Peter Fisher del laboratorio Lawrence Berkeley National Lab de la Universidad de California. La Universidad de California se complace en tener a este evento aquí especialmente porque nosotros hemos trabajado muy cercanamente con el UNAM, este, con otras instituciones mexicanas y ciertamente el avance de energía es uno de los ejes centrales de nuestra colaboración. Thank you so much. I want to welcome all of you, whether you're physically here with us or streaming from one of our Mission Innovation Partner countries, welcome to Mexico. We are very excited to host you this morning and to be able to share with you some of the early outcomes of what we believe represents the future of science diplomacy. 23 governments working together to shape a better future for all through science, through technology, through innovation, and through borderless collaboration, a shared vision, and a common sense of purpose. This is Mission Innovation. I want to thank our graceful hosts and partners in multiple endeavors, Casa California and the University of California system. Also, welcome our colleagues from the U.S. Embassy in Mexico in representation of our great friends and co-leads in the, this initiative, the U.S. Department of Energy. We are also honored to host a good friend of Mexico and co-lead on this project, Assistant Deputy Minister from Natural Resources Canada, Mr. Uh, Frank de Rosiers. Welcome, Frank. Also, welcome to the Deputy Head of Mission from the Canadian Embassy in Mexico, Chantal Chastenay. Welcome. Our partners in this innovation challenge, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, represented today by Rebecca Finley. Please give our best regards to Alan Bernstein. Welcome. Dr. Mario Molina, thank you for joining us. The President of the Mexican Society of Materials, Dr. Claudia Gutierrez Wing. The executive team in charge of the workshop and all of these efforts, uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, Dr. Carlos Amador, Dr. Herman Tribukait, welcome. Thank you so much for all the efforts. And to all the scientists, public servants, and crazy, passionate, and driven people that have helped us get to this point, thank you so much. Today, we want to talk to you about science, because science is a universal language that transcends borders and cultures, and because science can help us stand up as humankind to find solutions to our most pressing challenges. Also, science is the language that 23 governments chose, uh, 23 governments from around the world chose to use as a viable path uh, to produce the technologies that will help us drive a global energy transition. Mission Innovation is this platform that is allowing us to raise borders and join efforts in a shared vision and a common sense of purpose. Let me share with you briefly about the innovation challenges behind Mission Innovation. Well, of course, that if 23 governments agreed to work together, we needed to frame the challenges that we jointly saw as the biggest opportunities to advance clean energy technologies to the next level. And we're not talking about incremental improvements, but radical paradigm shifts that will produce the next generation of ultra-cheap, ultra-efficient, and ultra-clean energy technologies. So the countries in MI agreed to work on seven innovation challenges, and today we will share with you the progress of Innovation Challenge 6 and its materials uh, acceleration platform. 
What we will see today is a product of 55 plus of the best scientists from 17 countries around the world working for five days straight to come up with a pathway that will help accelerate uh, functional material design and development for energy applications by an order of magnitude, at least from decades to years, perhaps months, days. But you won't be hearing the details from me. Instead, we are honored today to host Professor Alanas Burugusic, mastermind of this scientific initiative and a very good friend. He will be sharing with you an in-depth lecture because we want to make sure that all of you leave this place with a bigger understanding of what it is that we're trying to achieve and why we think this is such a transformational and cool initiative. We are sure you will leave as excited about this as we are. We at the Secretary of Energy believe this work will spark a wave of bilateral and multilateral collaboration programs and that this work and the Mission Innovation Platform will lay the foundations for future of science diplomacy as well for future clean energy technologies. And this is what our energy reform has been all about, creating a vibrant, international, and dynamic energy sector that will drive our country forward. Again, on behalf of CENER, I want to express how thankful we are to have the US and Canada, two incredible countries as co-leads in this initiative. And thankful to all the MI countries that are endorsing and engaging in this exciting adventure. We hope you enjoy the presentations and let us show a face of Mexico some of you don't know. Thank you so much. Under Secretary Lassi, um, Assistant Deputy Minister de Rosé, Dr. Molina, uh, distinguished representatives of government, academia, and members of the private sector, it's an honor to be here with you today. Uh, thank you all for the successful, long-standing science and technology cooperation you have made possible between our great nations. Ambassador Jacobson sends her regards and congratulations for the great work so many of you have contributed to this project. Mission Innovations Initiative's goals are truly ambitious and it will take all of our combined intellect, grit, and determination to achieve them. It's thrilling to be present at today's presentation of the report on the joint Mexico-US-led Clean Energy Innovation Challenge, which included the support of Canada, the European Union, and others. And we welcome Canada joining uh, as a, as a co-lead. Thank you. In our rapidly developing world, clean energy innovation is one of our prime imperatives. We are in great need of the skills and talents that have been brought to bear on this initiative. I thank you all for the effort and energy you have dedicated to this project and congratulate you on what you have achieved. We look forward to many more great things to come as we continue working together to make our societies cleaner, more efficient, and more sustainable. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here and back to Mexico after uh, our my last visit where we had this workshop going on in September and we had all those great minds from those 17 countries being present, not only experts in the field of computation, artificial intelligence, automation, material science, but also people who share that kind of passion and potential that uh, development of advanced materials could potentially have on our respective countries in the world. And just to put it in perspective, and uh, we'll hear from people who are more expert than I am about this in, in a very short moment, but we have in the case of advanced materials, a very key component in making sure that we are able to develop uh, uh, advanced clean energy systems, which account for about a half the cost, uh, the materials element alone. So being able to accelerate the pace of innovation in that space is really, really important. Uh, está por esta región que Canadá está encantada dado de unirse a México y los Estados Unidos como co-líder del reto de innovación de materiales avanzados para energías limpias de la misión de innovación. Esta una ocasión única para nuestros tres países para avanzar en su compromiso común con la misión de innovación y con la colaboración norteamericana en materia de energía. Nuestros respectivos ministros y secretarios uh, se reunieron recientemente, recientemente a Houston para discutir uh, sectores de colaboración para los tres países. One of their central uh, plea to us was to keep those initiatives concrete and real, to strive to have genuine impact. And I really feel that this particular initiative has a shot at achieving very much that. Needless to say that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, in this particular case, 
as the potential to transform our societies. And in this particular case, it's very much true, as we're able to accelerate greatly the pace of advancement and uh, the development of advanced materials. And it doesn't limit itself in the impact in the energy space. We also have a chance of using those discoveries in other fields, transportation, infrastructures, along with many others. So Canada is delighted to be able to join in as a co-lead for this initiative with a great lead already exercised by the government of Mexico and the United States on that front. And we are pleased also to signal that we'll be uh, hosting uh, events this spring. Uh, two events are scheduled for the month of March and the month of May in Hamilton and Toronto, where we'll be able to further explore the potential to advance uh, that very important work. And maybe just to close, to reiterate uh, the Government of Canada's commitment to carry on that march toward a lower carbon economy, we see this as a great concrete step to do so, and do so with our friends from North America and the world. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Well, dear Mission Innovation Partners, esteemed colleagues, guests, and excellencies, uh, dear MI representatives and friends uh, that are watching us on the live stream around the world, uh, on behalf of the Mexican government, it is a real pleasure for me to welcome you there, here, uh, today in Mexico City to present the expert workshop report of Clean Energy Materials Innovation Challenge one of the seven challenges uh, of the Global Initiative Mission Innovation. So the name of this report uh, is Materials Acceleration Platform, is this one. Believe me, is beyond state of the art, uh, science, and technology. Uh, first, I would like to recognize and thank CENER and CONACYT and our team Mexico in this in innovation challenge, as well as the very large support teams working tirelessly <clears throat> behind the scenes to make this initiative such a success. I also want to recognize and thank our co-leaders and partners in this initiative since day one, the U.S. Department of Energy and their teams, including energetics. Last but not least, thank you to the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research, CIFAR, that's the, 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 the way to pronounce it, <laughs> Uh, for joining us as partners uh, in the expert workshop, in the report, and in these initiatives going forward. Dear Assistant Deputy Minister Franck de Rossier, uh, welcome to Mexico. It is a pleasure to see you here again. I have the honor to officially announce that the Natural Resources Canada is joining this initiative as the third co-leader and partner. Uh, Minister de Rossier, uh, thank you very much for being here, and thank you and the National Resources Canada uh, uh, Ministry uh, for your partnership and leadership in this initiative. Uh, we look forward to continue working with you and with all our MI partners on this innovation challenge. As you all know, Mexico is implementing its ambition and transformative energy reform. The government is committed to executing its long-term strategy and vision and to promote Mexico's transition to a low, low uh, carbon energy. I, I could add low carbon uh, and resilient economy. This vision fits perfectly with the goals and aspirations of mission innovation and of this inspiring and ambitious challenge. Innovation will play a key role in accelerating the development of clean energy technologies and the transformation of the energy sector worldwide. This is why Mexico proposed this innovation challenge and is proud to collide it with our North American neighbors and partners. As I stated in Marrakesh in November 2016 at the COP22, I reiterate here today, Mexico is fully committed to mission innovation. Mission innovation is one of the two strategic initiatives launched during the COP21 two years ago. I'm very happy to see that we have been able to keep the momentum of the Paris Agreement, reinforcing its implementation phase. As we will hear today from the lead experts uh, of this initiative, materials discovery is a key element of the innovation cycle in the entire energy sector. It is also a path to disruptive innovation, to create new technologies and create new markets. 
Thus, the innovation challenge and the milestones that we are celebrating here today will expand the opportunities and will also help accelerate the urgent transition to a low carbon economy. Moreover, we celebrate that this innovation challenge and mission innovation are opening the doors to impactful R&D collaborations with our neighbors in North America and globally. In order to elaborate on these opportunities, I now would like to invite the leaders of these efforts to share with us the work done to date, uh, present the report, and to share their inspiring and transformative vision of what is possible going forward, including from our co-leaders from the US and now Canada. Thank you very much indeed. Muchas gracias. Buenos días a todos. It is my pleasure to be here today to represent CIFAR, and I bring very warm wishes from my president and CEO, Dr. Alan Bernstein. He very much wanted to be here today. He has been a champion of this partnership from its very earliest days. And today we celebrate the first Mission Innovation Roadmap for International Collaboration. Challenge 6, the Clean Energy Materials Innovation Challenge, was created to accelerate the exploration, discovery, and use of new high-performance, low-cost energy materials. The six recommendations in this report lay out an evidence-based roadmap to tackle this challenge. They create a framework for interdisciplinary research teams and provide important information for leaders in policy, industry, and civil society. And at CIFAR, we believe in the importance of this work because it is to tackle these types of complex global challenges that CIFAR exists. From renewable energy to successful societies, from artificial intelligence to precision health, from quantum computing to the extreme universe, to name just some CIFAR programs, we aim to bring together the best minds to advance research with the potential to change the world. And we are very happy to have helped make this important milestone happen. We are honored to continue to support the work of CIFAR senior fellows in our bio-inspired solar energy program. And together, they aim to unlock the secrets of photosynthesis to revolutionize solar energy technology. And we are also proud that CIFAR was one of the very early supporters of artificial intelligence research. Today, we continue to support advances in deep and reinforcement learning through our program in learning in machines and brains and our leadership of the pan-Canadian AI strategy. It was in March 2017 that CIFAR fellows in these two programs held a research workshop in Boston on machine learning and energy materials science that concluded with a policy roundtable with representatives from some of the mission innovation countries. And so when the idea of this workshop emerged, we were delighted to partner with SINAR and the US Department of Energy to make it happen. The workshop co-chairs CIFAR senior fellow Alan Aspiroguzic and Professor Kristen Person did a superb job, both of organizing an extraordinary international interdisciplinary conference and also of collaborating with the many authors to write this landmark report. Congratulations to all on this very important achievement. And in closing, I'd like to recognize one of our most important partners, the Government of Canada. We look forward to working with National Resources Canada and all of the mission innovation partners to continue on this important journey to a low carbon future. Thank you. In the next few minutes, I will tell you why I, uh, the vision of uh, the importance of this to Mexico to our partners and to the world. Mission innovation in a few words, it's a global opportunity to accelerate the urgent transition to a clean economy, or shall we say, to a better carbon economy. To join forces in North America and the world in energy innovation and to improve the quality of life on Earth for all. We heard from Christine and others, materials are essential. They represent 50 to 80% of the cost of uh, manufacturing uh, clean energy. And they are essential to solve the biggest challenges that we face today. The expert workshop report brought together the leading experts, the leading scientists in the world on these key topics, material sciences, 
advanced computing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, and robotics. Our scientists are telling us we, it makes sense to develop these material acceleration platforms. What is that? And we'll hear from Alan in a minute, in a minute what it means. But it's essentially a fully automated, autonomous, meaning smart and super fast materials factory. We need the international collaborations of scientists around the world. That's what we're calling here for. We need multidisciplinary experiences at all levels starting early in school through university, college, beyond that, in science, technology, engineering, and math. So we need more effective communications. Dr. Mario Molina here, it's an honor to have you here. You have told us we need to tell the stories. We need to explain to the leaders, the policymakers, the leaders in the world, why we need to do these activities of basic research, science, and apply it. I want to share with you a few quotes quickly from the participants in this workshop. This, are, this is feedback we re received after the workshop. So we, were, we are at the edge of imagination. We brought together scientists to work collectively to face these big challenges and to hope and to build a better fit future. This last quote here really uh, touched me. The event will be remembered in the future if we succeed as the beginning of a new era of material discovery. Next steps, we called for these collaborations in R&D, invest in mission-oriented uh, projects, R&D with our scientists in an international setting. We call or we invite everyone, all the, the 23 members in Mission Innovation to actively participate, to join us. A global challenge requires a global response. It's a big opportunity, and we need to accelerate innovation, and we need to start, and we need to do it now. Please join us, our keynote speaker of today, Professor Alan Aspurugusic, co-chair and lead author of the report, quantum chemist at Harvard University, a pioneer in a lot of these topics. Uh, he has introduced a number of um, new technologies, like the flow batteries, like the organic LEDs, the oil LEDs, and he's actively developing the Chem OS. We will, we will hear exactly about what he's all about. Please, Alain, without further ado, join me, please, with a big round of applause to our great scientists here today. Alain, thank you very much. Thank you for all your help. It's an honor to be here. Um, today I'll be telling you about a little bit of the technical content of the report and acknowledging a diverse audience, I'll, I'll go between general level discussion to some detail back and forth. Okay, and as Christine, Christine is not here, but Christine was fundamental to, to this report and she's my co-chair. So the first thing I want to say is that this is a workshop by 55 scientific representatives and about 100 observers. So what I'm going to present to you is not just my ideas, but it's, a, it's, a con it's in the context of all these representatives from all these countries. And not, it, it, not, it did not begin at the report, it began way before, and it continued all the way to, to today. Let's just begin by talking about energy, and in particular, here are some of the technologies that we're thinking about, uh, but as Christine told you in the video, all energy technologies have to do with materials. Materials dominate the cost of most of the processes, and here are some of the ones that we highlighted in the report, as places where particularly materials innovation will actually make a difference. So I decided to show you two of them, solar energy and batteries, mainly because I pers personally am involved in them. Um, what I wanna, I'm not gonna read to you to the right all these different lists you can read by yourselves, but you can see key important materials discovery opportunities that could be benefited from this platform. At the bottom, you see, for example, a double perovskite from the Ted Sargent Group at the University of Toronto, where he's using a combination of machine learning and synthesis to actually create the next generation of solar cells. Okay, so that's an example where this technology is applied as of today. I saw these results from Ted literally a week ago. In the case of batteries, uh, my group and others around the world are thinking a lot about large-scale energy storage. Humanity has never stored energy at the largest scale. We basically produce it and waste it, but now we are at the point where we need to actually store energy to, to have a, a complete renewable energy transition. Uh, a picture that you see here in the bottom 
it's an experimental flow battery uh, made at Harvard University with basically full organic molecules. I'm also proud to say that in Mexico, it's a big effort actually in organic flow batteries uh, undergoing here uh, by support from Sener uh, on this topic. And you can see on the right all the different type of the, uh, you know, opportunities. For example, what is the best molecule to put in such battery? So how do we think about materials? Well, we're going to think about it as a cornucopia, right? We have a horn of plenty. This is about at least 10 to, the 108, 10 to the 180 possible materials, if we include materials and molecules, that we could make in about six months of human time each material, right? The problem is that 10 to the 180 is an incredible number to search for the right material. So you really not want to think about the cornucopia where all the molecules are going to be good, but actually an inverted cornucopia where you have 10 to the 180 possibilities, but you have to actually use different technologies to sift down from those uh, huge number of candidates to the candidates you actually have to incorporate in a, in a device. And this process, as, as I mentioned before, has been quite slow, has been done the same way we have done it in the last 300 years or so, or 400 years of science. In a, I imagine I do something once by hand, I test it by hand, and so on. I mean, going back and forth in that approach, it takes decades. Okay? So here are some of the barriers, right, to actually do with this cornucopia. Okay? So first of all, uh, we've spent, we have shown before this report, and I'm going to show you a couple of key results from Christine's lab, Gerd Sieder's lab, and my lab, you can actually predict materials using the computer. The way to sift very quickly from this is to actually take advantage of high throughput screening and, and artificial intelligence to quickly select candidates. The issue up to this report was that once you actually have the candidates, you hand them over to a human. And sometimes the human decides to make a, a material that is closely related but not the material you suggested, or they just disappear, don't make it, the ship it is lost in shipment, etc. Okay? So we need to bring closer the material synthesis and characterization to the calculation and actually make a platform, right? So that's the suggestion of this workshop, to build an integrated design platform to close the discovery loop and accelerate uh, scientific progress. And, and remember, these funnels are incredibly large. You want to go from 10 to the 180 to perhaps a million or 400,000 or 500,000 candidates that you can calculate, and only a handful that you can synthesize if you go manually. Perhaps we can synthesize thousands a week or so if we go automated. Uh, let me show you a couple examples. This is one from Kristin, from her lab. She actually started looking for catalysts in one of the most exciting areas of energy, sunlight to fuels. The idea that you actually put a flask somewhere out there in the sun, and as light is, is hitting it, it's actually making a fuel for your car or it's making you know, an important industrially relevant material like a polymer. This is one of those frontier energy research areas where actually rapid discovery is needed. And, and Christine has shown actually here uh, an inverted cornucopia here on the right um, of how the blue things are calculations and the, and the um, red things are experimental. And you can see that she ended up with 15 or so uh, candidates that were actually made and tested. And she, 16 new photocatalysts were, were, were demonstrated using this technology starting from all the data from the materials project. So that's an example of a success story of this approach with handmade materials. So what we want to do in this project is to actually make this cornucopia way uh, more efficient. I'll give you one case study from my laboratory. Um, uh, this is, I like this because this is an industrial collaboration with academia that actually resulted in a high-performing material. So a little bit of interesting um, uh, idea is that this is... Uh, this is a very diverse audience, but what I'm showing you is the first, second, and third generation technologies for display. Okay? The third generation of display requires a very weird molecule that has the singlet and triplet energies very close to each other so that it emits 100% of light instead of only 25% of light on the left-hand side of this diagram. Okay? So uh, the issue is that people believe those molecules didn't exist. But I just told you there's about 10 to the 180 possible molecules out there so a key discovery in 2012 by Professor Chihaya Dachi led us to actually find such molecules, and, uh, and uh, the problem is that there were not too many. So what my group and I did is actually collaborate with computer scientists, chemists, and material scientists, device engineers, a huge team at Samsung that synthesized and tested these materials, and uh, we ended up with uh, an inverted cornucopia that has this, this, the, the type of technology that we're trying to advocate here, without the robotics, and that's why we're only able to synthesize only 40 molecules in three years 
in the largest project my group has ever done in terms of funding. So what you see in the box in the left is all the possible candidates that we looked at, and as you see in the corners of the box, by use of machine learning, high throughput screening, and even human-computer interaction voting, we created a Tinder of molecules, we were able to discover interesting candidates. Uh, three champion candidates were published, and they are am amongst the best uh, performing organic, organic light emitting diodes. And finally, another, another reason of, uh, another list of past successes is the work of Gerd Seeder, the original founder of the materials genome, professor at UC Berkeley. You can see here a list of all the materials, super, super ionic conductors, you know, magnesium battery cathodes, this has worked a lot in batteries, that he has discovered with his group and collaborators, in collaboration with industry, for battery technology. So these are just three case studies, and there's many more in the world, of what has been done with the computers without an integrated platform. So what I want you to imagine is what will happen when we have the robotics and everything in a closed loop. So this is another diagrammatic uh, that we like to talk about in emission innovation. I'd like to show this slide. It shows the materials design process from the left to the right, from intuiting molecules and simulating them, that was the old approach, to the approach I just showed you that includes quantum simulation, machine learning, and library generation. What mission innovation is all about is bringing automation to the next level of the chain, to synthesis characterization and testing, to gain higher speed ups throughout the chain of discovery. And that's what will allow us in a conservative fashion to get a tenfold speed up in materials discovery. We believe this is just the baseline and we can get future uh, uh, acceleration in the topic. So, uh, how, how do we go about it? What are the recommendations of the workshop? Well, the first one is to actually improve our understanding of what it really means to have a materials genome initiative, okay? Which is a United, initi United States initiative of the past administration to involve data science, synthesis, and um, computation to actually discover materials, we believe that we actually need to really involve the robotic synthesis and characterization to actually achieve what we like to call self-driving laboratories. Laboratories that allow us to discover uh, chemical space and material space way faster. So, Moore's law is a beautiful context, context, concept of doubling the rate of something as a function of time. In particular, the number of transistors in a chip have been doubled as a function of time uh, by the investment from the, uh, say, uh, electronics industry. Other industries in science have actually benefited from this exponential growth in uh, efficiency. For example, the cost of sequencing a human genome is actually faster than what a Moore's law will predict. Now you can, see, you can actually sequence a human genome under $1,000. Before, you can see there, it was $100 million to sequence a single human genome in a time span of only 15 years. This is an inspiration to us. Can we achieve the same success as materials uh, in, in the material space? And actually, we are inspired by this. And if you think about what made this happen, what made this happen is automation. Now, everything that happens in human genome sequencing is DNA going through these nanopores all in an automated fashion, right? So how can we do that? Well, this is a figure from Marty Burke, one of our workshop participants that I really am inspired about. He says, well, everything has to be modular. We have to think about how to make the materials modularly. Put them together piece by piece, like a Lego piece or a tower. This is the way we build the largest things in the world, by modularity. So we have to bring the concept of modularity into material synthesis, for example. So, the platform, as has been alluded before, has screening, synthesis, and characterization. Okay? So that's our main recommendation. If you want to remember a single slide from this talk, just take a, a photo of this one, right? Uh, so, how does it work? We thought about how to make this happen, and these are the six different challenges or research directions that people have to work together in the world to make it work. The first one is the idea, again, of closing the loop. There are high throughput facilities out there, high throughput calculation facilities, but nobody almost in the world has actually made a machine that actually calculates, synthesizes, and tests all in the, at once. Uh, Benji Maruyama, one of the pioneers at the Air Force Research Labs, did so for carbon nanotube growth synthesis. And he achieved a hundredfold speed up in material synthesis and characterization. He was a workshop participant, key leader of this, and actually we're engaging with him in a lot of uh, different discussions. He's an uh, inspiration for this, for, this, for this idea, and he's the one that idea, introduced this idea of materials, uh, a Moore's law for materials discovery. Okay? So that's, that's an example. Another example that I'd like to talk about is, of course, we have to advance artificial, this is another one of the research directions, right? What, the first one, sorry, the first one is, 
we have to have more examples than just Benji's laboratory. Okay? So we're working actively, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and all their participants to actually build laboratories like Benji's for a variety of energy applications. Um, artificial intelligence for materials. Artificial intelligence is a very powerful tool, but it has to be adapted and modified and expanded to the particular topic at hand. So AI for healthcare is going to be different than AI for materials or AI for for um, you know, uh, urban planning, okay? So many groups around the world, including ours, have thinking about and developing AI tools that are custom tailored for testing and making materials. Um, this is an example of the ChemOS that Herman was, developed, was talking about. It's a database-driven robot control system that uses machine learning to pick what's the next best experiment. And I think it would be nice to actually show you uh, if you actually were to go right now in your device, to this URL here in the bottom, it's a Twitch, it's one of these gaming websites that you can watch online to play video games. Herman, let's not click on it, because let's just see, I have an animation here, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna click on it right now, just not to waste your time, but if you click on your phone right now, you will see the robot working, I have a recorded video of it. Here's a robot at the University of British Columbia, injecting samples in an HPLC machine, controlled by a software at Harvard, okay? And it's happening in real time, okay? Believe me, if you wanna go to the website right now, you will see the robot being controlled by Harvard. And this is an example of the delocalized materials discovery platforms that we wanna have unleashed in the entire planet through this innovation, okay? The interesting thing is that we left the first experiment at night, and uh, there was a baseline that, they, but there was a maximum that Jason Hine at UBC said, this is the maximum we can get. Our AI software got beyond that maximum in 17 tries. So we were extremely happy in the morning when we got the results of this uh, uh, ChemOS result. So anyway, that's an example of the kind of vision, and this is just the beginning, okay? This is another machine, I just, was, I just traveled to see it last week. This is called the machine. I asked Marty Burke, what's the name of this thing? He says, it's the machine, okay? So please see the machine. Robotic synthesis for organic molecules. Marty Burke is a, is a pioneer, he says, Organic chemistry is all about modularity. We're gonna take small fragments, about 150 of them are enough to reach 75% of all the natural products, okay? So you could build these machines to actually unleash them on drug discovery or unleash them on materials. So um, we started working together with him and he's an active, super excited partner of this, uh, of this uh, workshop. He actually is the author of one of the quotes that Herman was, was citing. Here is an example of different molecules these are biomolecules that actually were made by this block synthesis in, uh, uh, efforts in these uh, robots, okay? Uh, so this is a slide from Marty that he presented at the workshop. Where he, you, he's talking about a similar approach for materials, right? We wanna think about, in his case, organic functional materials that are built piece by piece, okay? And we have a shared goal of actually demonstrating this for OLED in the next year or two. Um, so, and another challenge that I love is the challenge of inverse design. Imagine that sea of 180 molecules, and you want 10 to the 180 molecules, right? Incredible amount of molecules and materials. And you're gonna go from a structure to a property. So maybe this molecule is good for something, right? But I really wanna tune the performance. So what is really hard is inverse design, going from the property back to the pool of structures, right? And to do that, this is where uh, artificial intelligence is gonna come in. So how many of you know what deep learning is? F first thing is Facebook. How many of you have seen how Facebook tags your, your pictures? When you take a picture and suddenly your picture appears with your name on it. Isn't that freaky? Okay, that's done by, by deep learning. Next thing, next thing that is actually uh, um, already a reality is self-driving cars. This is an example of a self-driving car. Uber has a huge laboratory at Toronto where they're actually working on this. Um, Finally, um, you can play board games, and in our case, you can even design chemicals, okay? So artificial intelligence is gonna unleash the power of, of design. And why artificial intelligence is so important? Let's just look at your brain, okay? Your brain is a kilogram and a half. It has eight to the 10 to the 15 links, and it's able to recognize visually, for example, the motions, something that's very hard to do with a computer. Same thing, for example, the sonar of a bat, even with the size of a small plum, you can actually detect, uh, you know, in real time, this uh, sonar and move around. How, how can these devices do that? They do, they do this because they're doing nonlinear filtering in parallel, 
Okay? So these are very low power devices, our brains, that take their inputs and make them nonlinear response in a particular neuron, and actually um, that allows us to actually filter out a bunch of junk and garbage. Okay? So this is just a real example of the brain of a human going through different layers of your cortex. They are basically convoluted one into each other from going from an image that the beginning is just basically not a concept all the way down to the concept of a cat. So artifi uh, artificial neural networks uh, are part of this field called deep learning. It's called deep because there are many layers that are involved in these numerics to actually take inputs, combine them, and then nonlinearly respond them in these nonlinear response functions that that are actually combined in many, many different architectures to actually um, mimic, in some way, our brains. And AI, as you have heard many, in the news, perhaps, and in all different popular accounts, is really making strides in all areas of humanity. The way to do this is to actually connect these neural networks in many different ways. Um, for doing materials, my group and I have actually explored all these different connections of neural networks. Some of them are good for imagining materials, some of them are good for classifying materials. The whole point is that it's very easy to play with neural networks. They are also like Legos themselves. You can put them together in different ways to have different artificial intelligence tasks. So, uh, in my favorite paper uh, that actually just appeared this year, but it was in the archive for a couple of years, is the idea of actually using one of these neural networks to actually optimize molecules. So we're able to actually use a technology called autoencoder to actually carry out inverse design, which means that we can encode a molecule into a continuous 200 dimensional space, differentiate there and optimize and maximize in such a way that we can ask that space, can you please give me the best molecule for doing so? And the output of the, of the model will be, yes, this is a molecule. Okay? So I know these are very technical slides, but I want to take you deep down to what we really do in our field. So we actually train a computer with about 250,000 molecules to create a 200 dimensional space where we fish around for the good molecules. This has been done, and is being done for materials as we speak as well, and allows us to start with a lousy molecule in this particular case, and a molecule that it was not very drug-like and not very uh, sol solvent accessible area, to a very good molecule in this particular simulated example. So just imagine when this is coupled to a robot, and you have an inverse design system actually driving an experiment that has never been done. The first time it will be done is in this platform. Another example from a number of participants from Denmark, um, this is an example of taste vage. It's actually optimizing with genetic algorithms doing inverse design the structure of nickel copper nano nanoparticles. They're catalysts. So this is another example in another field, now inorganic materials, where we have this optimization process driving the loop. Um, so the, sec the sixth challenge is going to be data infrastructure. How are we going to be able to store all this information, looking at all the different challenges that we have, such as information, um, uh, so, so, so social intellectual property, for example? Okay? So there's going to be a hybrid model where, for example, companies will have their own data sets. And there's going to be public data sets generated by us, the scientists, sometimes jointly, etc. A big area that I think um, is not part of the report, but will be very soon in the next report, is the idea of materials data encryption. Such a way that if I'm a company, I want to share data with another company, I encrypt the data to give it to the third party, to, 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 to the other company, so we can collaborate with each other with, without ever knowing the secrets of each other. Okay? And that's a very important area. But at the moment, what people do is, for example, Kristen and Gerd Seeder uh, have this materials project at, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory that has a huge load of information for solid state materials. Um, there's, for example, at the University of Pittsburgh, the Pitt Quantum Repository that has a bunch of small molecules calculated with quantum chemistry. Our own Harvard Clean Energy Project has about 3 million organic photovoltaic molecules publicly available for uh, per use cell, machine learning, discovery. Um, um, Stefano Curtarolo and others have this AFLOW LIB database, also, also of solid state materials, that also allows you to do machine learning on the data online. So this is just the beginning. We have to have much more federated, much more um, complete databases. And when these databases are coupled to the robots in real time, we will have a very good accelerated design cycle. So these are the six recommendations that brings, bring us to the, together to the platform. So what next? The, the government officials here and the different organizations, um, 
already have federal plans to actually get the action going. We also have industry interested, several companies that I've been talking to and others have been talking to are getting on board. But what you really need to do is actually step on a plane and go around the world. So I'm going to show you a series of selfies that have happened since this workshop happened. At the workshop, here is our, our fearless leader, Herman Tribukai, talking to Mario Molina. That's workshop stage. Okay? And since the workshop, uh, I spent a lot of uh, CO2 fuel uh, traveling around the world. Uh, for example, I came to Mexico where Carlos Amador and Jose Alfredo Vasquez have the first robotic synthesis machine here in Mexico for this type of project. That's a serious synthesis machine that I just saw. Uh, so this is Mexico. Uh, this is Canada. Here we have Jason Hine and, and Curtis Berlinget having a lunchtime beer with me discussing our robotic project a few weeks ago. Um, this is Marty. I was there on Friday. Uh, we were thinking about how to make the machine 2.0. And this is Lee Cronin at Glasgow. I saw him in December. He is one of the most creative scientists. He couldn't come to the workshop, but he's fully fired, as he says, uh, to contribute to this. He just 3D printed chemical glassware to synthesize molecules. So he makes a 3D printed specific architecture to make a, a, a molecule. So he combines a lot of different technologies. He's trying to discover origins of life and other things using this automated technology. So uh, stay tuned for all this a cast of characters that, together with the other 55 workshop participants, are going to unleash the innovation of what's on the, on the workshop report. With that, I just want to leave you with this virtuous, double virtual cycle of the virtual world, machine learning and computation, coupled to automation and data. Okay? This is a virtual cycle that is going to allow us to actually um, change the world, hopefully, and come up with um, solar cells that are installed everywhere, flexible, or uh, your favorite dream about a battery that lasts long enough that you can watch videos all the way up, all through the day without charging your phone. And I really want to thank again, his, his name was mentioned so many times, but Danny Tabor there, sitting in the back, is my group member that actually herded the cats, wrote most of the technical part of the report, got everybody together. So uh, my name is, as a, as a writer of the report, but Danny was actually pushing uh, the cart and doing tons of work there. So thank you, Danny, for being here. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations for all the work. And given the time, just very briefly, this is really an amazing, I would say, second revolution in, in, in science. Science started at the beginning of the last century and changed all of our lives. So this is amazing. But I think it requires also an important revolution in learning mm -hmm. and teaching. How do you think this will impact uh, how students learn at universities? That's a very, very good question. Um, uh, like you, I think, I'm going to start with this question and then the other question. Um, I believe it's crucial to actually adapt our curriculum. So the course, I'm, at, I'm flying today, I'm leaving after this talk to teach tomorrow at Harvard a course that is called Physical Sciences 50, which is uh, an introduction to computer programming uh, for the sciences where we end up building a robotic titration machine. So now we have this machine that actually can mix chemicals and titrate. We used it over the summer to actually mix drinks and actually make alcoholic beverages and make better margaritas. We found uh, informally that 10% of vinegar, and Danny can correct me if that's wrong, actually improves the taste of margaritas. So if everybody wants to improve your margarita, just put 10% vinegar. As I'm, I'm personally moving to the University of Toronto, I'm gonna boot, make this course over there, they already are talking to me about it. So uh, this is something that I'm passionate about. I think we have to bring kids since the beginning. They love computers. And I think, if, if anything, computing and automation and robotics is something so hot that will bring more people to the material sciences. So I think that's, that's a very important question. To conclude, we'll hear a few uh, brief remarks by our Nobel laureate, Dr. Mario Molina. He doesn't need an introduction. He is, I just say, he has vice presidents around the world including obviously the presidents of Mexico, the Pope, and the world. Thank you for being here. You, and then you. we'll hear the closing for the close. Thank you. Thank you for all what you do, please. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I, I again want to congratulate all the participants in Mission Innovation and, then in, and for the production of, of this report report materials acceleration platform. I just want to say a few words about how this represents 
uh, marvelous opportunity uh, for us in Mexico. And uh, because historically what we see is that Mexico as a country has invested relatively little in science, education, and so on, half a percent of uh, uh, GDP compared to other countries that invest uh, a lot more. Uh, the point is that now science is, is certainly part of universal culture. So, but more importantly, the countries that invest more, their economies do much better. So there's really no excuse for Mexico not to join all this uh, uh, movement. But what is important is not just to invest more, but to do it well. So we have this opportunity to really move to the frontiers of science. And we can do that at the same time we have to do it through the frontiers of new education. So we are sure that our uh, <coughs> young students can catch up with this type of science, which is really uh, advancing in, in, in an incredible way. So uh, what do we need to do that? It, we are very lucky that the international scientific community is, uh, has this marvelous uh, principle that science is international, it's open to everybody. Once you get into industrial production and so on, there is, of course, competition. But science is open, as we just see. This is open for, for everybody. We have to take advantage of that, and we need to make sure that our young students participate in this uh, sort of global revolution in science. So by all means, first of all, thanks to all the international community. By the way, science doesn't tell us what to do, but it's this ethical principle. Let's work all together so that for the, for the benefit of uh, all the inhabitants of our planet, we have um, some huge challenges like climate change that I work with, for which we need better science, better technology. So let's do it. Let's work together. We know we can do it, but let's do it at the very frontiers of science, frontiers of knowledge. Thank you for your attention. My name is Carlos Amador, and I am professor of chemistry at UNAM nearby this beautiful place. I am thankful, honored, and proud to have served as a scientist academician in this uh, saga, the Accelerated Materials Discovery Challenge. As a scientist, I have, I have had to keep pace with the big leaguers you have heard about a few minutes ago. Not very effectively, I have to say, although a recent finding may send me to AAA league, maybe not the big leaguers, but AAA pretty soon. As an academician, I have been the spokesperson of the challenge to the academic community here in Mexico, mostly directors, chairs, and general authorities. As I said, I am very proud of what we have accomplished with the presentation of this report. You see, in the big leagues, we could find the world leader of robotic organic synthesis, and via Alain's and Christine's magic, make him jump on the challenge bandwagon. And same thing with the other authors of this report. But in Mexico, we don't necessarily have already a world-leading scientist in machine learning for materials discovery. Now we have to convince our finest scientists which are very good in what they do, to apply their abilities to make advance this saga. We have already started with young, ambitious, brilliant guys like Diego Solis and Carolina Suriak. But in order to really become a powerhouse for materials discovery, we have to convince many more leading scientists to jump on the challenge bandwagon. We all know that the most effective way of doing so is through huge investments of money. We have heard already that Mexico is willing to do so, but to keep pace with the big leaguers, we also have to do it fast. And for that, we need the help and committed participation of many of the actors of the academic community, directors, chairs, and general authorities at universities, institutes, CONACYT, 
other public offices, secretariats. I am confident we will get them on this challenge. Thank you very much. It's my honor and privilege to be here to present and talk to you about uh, the Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales. Uh, I have to say, uh, many of the goals and the things that were presented here resonate very much with the purposes of our society. I have to say that in Mexico, there's a large and diverse community dedicated to uh, basic and applied research. I have to say, so far in 2016, there were about 2,750 people dedicated to research and development in this field. Most of them, like 95%, were uh, located in 108 institutions. Since before, the community dedicated to materials uh, science and engineering uh, research uh, was very important. So um, in 1990, the Academia Mexicana de Materiales was founded with the ideas of uh, Dr. Yakaman and some of his uh, colleagues that visualize the importance of having a Mexican, academic Mexican society that allowed the diffusion of this uh, knowledge of research that was being developed in Mexico, and also to attract the interest of uh, young um, uh, students to this uh, scientific and technological field. So uh, once the academia was uh, founded, the main activity was the organization of the International Materials Research Congress. Uh -huh. So then, in 2009, this association was uh, reconstituted as Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales, which is the current name. And uh, that time also, the Sociedad made an alliance with MRS, which is the Materials Research Society in Mexico, to jointly organize this conference. So that will bring more benefits to the members of the SMM and promote new activities. Um, so, such as a stronger collaboration between uh, colleagues in Mexico and other countries, um, bring more students in the field, and we also promote uh, this collaboration with the uh, community through the student chapters programs. Also, uh, to reinforce this relationship between academia and industry. So, uh, currently, um, the Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales represent Mexico in international forums of this type. So, uh, purposes of um, SMM, I'm not gonna read all of this, but we can briefly um, make an abstract of them. So the main purpose is to provide forums where the uh, research that is being developed in Mexico and other, uh, in other countries related to the field of material science can be discussed. So, uh, and have this networking of colleagues and bring students and make this community to, uh, be together. So who are the members of SMM? SMM members are mainly uh, participants at the conference at the IMRC, uh, uh, who perform activities based on also this diffusion of uh, knowledge, uh, experimental research, uh, academic uh, development students, promotion of uh, the appropriate use of science and technology, all for the benefit of humanity. Mm -hmm. So currently we have about 2,000 members from more than 50 countries, where approximately between 50 and 60% of the members are from Mexico. <laughs> so which are the main activities? Uh, what we uh, believe is that we need to facilitate communication between uh, members, Mm -hmm. with different sectors, academia, industry, uh, government. We do this mainly through the organization of the annual conference of the IMRC. Um, we also have uh, student chapter programs. Um, we also support uh, the uh, logistic organization of other institutions. And because all of this and the uh, experience that we have in this uh, organization of the event, um, I have to say we are part of the International Union of Materials Research Societies, and uh, we were given also the organization um, to uh, prepare the International Conference on Advanced Materials in 2021. So this is a worldwide conference where uh, scientists and technology uh, people in the material science and engineering uh, participate. 
what's the International Materials Research Congress? So this is an event that is organized every year in August time. Uh, as I said, we have about uh, 2,000 participants. And we have these different activities. We have plenary talks, symposia, tutorials, workshop, and we have some uh, activities that are dedicated mainly to uh, students. This is an overview of some of the activities that we had in 2017. This is uh, the, well, the first left-hand side uh, picture is of our uh, inauguration. Then we have uh, Professor Penico, who was uh, one of our plenary speakers. We have here some of the professional development courses, uh, graduate fairs, to, uh, poster presentation, and some of the workshop that we had during our conference. So uh, IMRC has been growing steadily over the last 10 years. We have been uh, having an increase of, the f of 5%. Uh, we received more than 2,900 abstracts for our program, um, 1,806 uh, participants from uh, over 40 countries, um, 48 symposia, workshops, tutorials. And um, one thing that I want to highlight is the participation of our plenaries among them. I mean, they are leaders in the field, among them many uh, Nobel laureates. This year we will have a Professor Ben Feringa, who's a Chemistry uh, Nobel Prize for 2016. So uh, even we ha we have uh, so many topics. This is this is our eight of the topics that we uh, work this year. And uh, in addition to this energy uh, topic that we work, we have many other symposiums that might have some energy related uh, activities. So, uh, but this, uh, the way we uh, design the symposium that is going to be taking part of the program is shaped depending on the uh, particular problems, challenges, and uh, hot topics that are present at the time in the material science and engineering field. So this, uh, this year we will have a plenary talk, CAPTA Driven Materials Design. We will have some uh, topic in energy, and also we will have two symposia that are dedicated to the topic that is being talked at this conference, at, this, uh, at the event. And in 2009, we will have this special topic that chairs uh, want to call the attention to, materials by design, current computational methods in material science. So uh, these are uh, different symposia that have been offered from 2014 to 2017 related to energy. We can see that with time, this uh, topic is increasing also in our conference. These are participants that have been, uh, we have had in that period. We can see that this is growing. The first uh, bar corresponds to uh, researchers in Mexico. The second bar corresponds to uh, participants in some other countries. Also, students are involved in this field uh, from Mexico and from other countries. So uh, the way we can work together is uh, one of the main purposes of us, as I said, is to try to network with um, people from the different sectors, academia, industry, government, uh, working together in this uh, field, aiming to develop uh, applications for benefit to humanity. Mm -hmm. So I uh, want to say, uh, lastly, that the existence of a material acceleration platform, working in parallel with experimental theoretical centers, might help to get faster uh, results to solve particular problems in the field of energy. So lastly, I want to say that this year in 2008, we will have some activities that are dedicated specifically to the topic uh, of this workshop. Thank you so much.